December 2nd, 2015. Two gunmen stage a cold-blooded attack in San Bernardino, California. I've got, now we have two suspects, both dressed in black. This is the Inland Regional Center where county workers were having a trainee day and a Christmas party last year. Around 11 a.m., two shooters entered with assault rifles into this conference center where they killed 14 people, injured more than 20 others. Things are still blocked off here. The shooting was over in minutes. Police and ambulances rushed to the scene. So we had what turned into a massive tactical search operation of that entire property in conjunction with extracting all of the injured folks. Police Chief Jared Burguant led the emergency response. We start to get some pretty clear information that the suspects had fled. A couple of hours later, investigators got a tip about a black SUV. And when we followed up with the rental car company, they confirmed that it was running to a Sayed Farouk. Syed Farouk was a San Bernardino County employee. He lived with his wife, Tashfeen Malik, and their six-month-old daughter. Right here. And so they followed the SUV back through some technology and uh, various surveillance cameras around town and stuff like that. We've been able to track their movement, and they actually never left the area. We have units at San Bernardino and Richardson that are taking fire. See one guy down. There's one guy in the back of a car. When the police finally caught up with the vehicle, it all came to a head here. Actually, right here, next to this fence, there was a massive gun battle. And when the smoke cleared, Malik was dead in the car, and Farouk's body lay in the street. Okay, we need medical aid. There was no digital footprint left to indicate why they attacked the Inland Regional Center, or even if there was another secondary spot that they planned on, or just nothing. With the killers dead, the FBI pursued the investigation. The shooter's cell phones were found smashed in a garbage bin. But then, the FBI made a discovery. Investigators found a car a few minutes from their house, registered in Farouk's mother's name. Inside that car, they found his work iPhone. Picture of the 14 victims from that day. At the time, the San Bernardino shooting was called the deadliest terror attack on U.S. soil since September 11th. ISIL claimed the attack, and the community mourned the 14 victims. But soon, Farouk's work iPhone took center stage. Why was the iPhone so important to the investigation? You know, we have a promise and a commitment to the victims and the folks that were impacted by this that we will leave no stone unturned. It was critical to get into that phone. Probably the most important reason was, are there contacts or other conversations to indicate that there were co-conspirators involved in the attack? Was it immediately given to the FBI? It was in the FBI's possession the entire time. The entire time, and, and they weren't able to get into it. The phone was a county phone. But he had the ability to, uh, uh, to, to lock the phone himself. So as a result, it's just his lock on the phone with his password. And then the concern is, is that uh, based upon that version of iOS uh, and that version of encryption, that they can only make X amount of attempts to get into the phone and it would have erased all the data. And so that was the dilemma that the FBI was in. The FBI asked Apple to write a new version of the operating system for the phone, which would allow them an infinite number of tries to guess the password without encrypting all the data. Apple refused. The FBI took Apple to court and invoked a statute known as the All Writs Act to force Apple to rewrite the software. Apple pushed back in an open letter to their customers. If the government can use the All Writs Act to make it easier to unlock your iPhone, it would have the power to reach into anyone's device to capture their data. The government could extend this breach of privacy and demand that Apple build surveillance software to intercept your messages.
In Washington, Congress held a hearing, and FBI Director Jim Comey was called to testify. This case in San Bernardino is not about the FBI, it's not about Apple, it's not about Congress, it's not about anything other than trying to do a competent investigation in an ongoing active case. That said, of course, any decision by a judge in any forum is going to be potentially precedential. You have a multi-billion dollar budget. Is the burden so high on you that you could not defeat this product either through getting the source code and changing it or some other means? Are you testifying oh, I that? I see. I would, uh, we wouldn't be litigating if we could. We have engaged all Then, at the end of March, the FBI dropped the case and announced it paid an unnamed entity to hack the phone. The price was a secret, rumored to be around a million dollars. What um, was eventually found on Farouk's iPhone? Was it helpful to the um, investigation? I, I will just speak in very general terms in that uh, the FBI is pleased that they got in. The FBI was able to fulfill their promise to the victims that will leave no stone unturned. I think there were some things in there that validated some components of the investigation, but there was no smoking gun. No smoking gun. Encryption uses algorithms to encode data to make it indecipherable to anyone who isn't authorized to see it. It's meant to keep information private and safe from tampering on computers or cell phones and as it travels between them. To the FBI's critics, the case against Apple looked like an attempt to set a legal precedent forcing a company to undermine its own encryption. This is really just gonna hurt Americans. Attorney Cindy Cohn is the executive director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, one of dozens of civil liberties groups and tech companies that backed Apple. It does appear to us, especially in hindsight, that the San Bernardino case was one that the government picked to try to make its agenda go forward and not one where they actually needed a change in the law or for Apple to rewrite its operating system. And the reason we know that is that they bought an exploit and were able to get into the information. Why wouldn't someone want to help with that? But Apple helped a lot. Apple gave them access to uh, all of the information they had, which included all the metadata, right? So they knew everybody who got called from this phone, everybody who called into this phone. It was a Verizon phone. Uh, Verizon has the information about all the calling data. Uh, Apple had all the metadata. Um, so even as to this particular phone, they had all of this. But as to the phones that were destroyed, they had all of this too. Apple versus FBI wasn't Cindy's first battle with the U.S. government in the so-called crypto wars. Legal victories in the 90s paved the way for widespread use of encryption on the internet, for online banking, commerce, and mobile communication. Security matters to everybody now. It doesn't just matter to a little bit of technical elite. It doesn't just matter to the companies. This wasn't just about, it, it, it was about security versus privacy, but more importantly, it was about security versus security. In 2013, Edward Snowden leaked documents revealing the scope of the U.S. government surveillance programs. They showed that the National Security Agency had conscripted American tech and phone companies to help them spy. With mass surveillance in the headlines and hacks on the rise, many regular people started worrying about all the data they were putting online. For years, the best way of making your messages unreadable to anyone but the recipient you intended was an end-to-end -end encryption program known as PGP, short for Pretty Good Privacy. It's um, very complicated, doesn't really work that well, it's unreliable, it's just annoying to use. So, you know, I think what we're trying to do today is make something that's just accessible for everybody. And the most effective way to do that is just to have it be an invisible part of the thing that everyone's already using. Moxie Marlin Spike is one of the developers of the Signal Protocol and the force behind the Signal app, which encrypts messages end-to-end -end by default. The protocol has been integrated by the likes of WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger. How did you create Signal, and, and what problem were you trying to solve? There's two ways to think about security, right? Um, one is computer security, which is this idea that somehow we're going to make computers that are secure. And this is like a losing strategy. It's been a losing strategy for 30 years. Um, it's just not possible. Um, they're too complicated. If you have some information on a computer that's connected to the internet somewhere, um, it will eventually become public, you know, it will get hacked. Uh, and this has happened over and over again. And the other way to think about 
security is uh, what's known as information security, which is that instead of trying to secure computers, you secure the information your, itself. And that's what actually works. So you're talking about the right to privacy there, yeah? Um, well, I don't, I mean, I don't know that this is necessarily like a right to privacy. I think it's just an expectation and a desire that people have, right? That, um, you know, they communicate and that those things don't eventually become public. And all kinds of people have that desire and expectation. You know, a company like WhatsApp used to have to really um, put a lot of energy into trying to secure the computers that stored everyone's messages on the internet, you know? And um, not only is that impossible, but it's just, it's just a lot of liability, you know? It's, it's really difficult. And if instead, like, there's no valuable information for them to have to secure, then it just makes their job easier. Any sense of how many people are now using your protocols? More than a billion people, approaching more than two billion people. How do you get your head around that? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, it seems like a lot of people. Um, which is cool. I mean, that's the idea, is to try and make this stuff as ubiquitous as possible. The challenge we face is that the advent of default, ubiquitous, strong encryption is making more and more of the room that we are charged to investigate dark. There was always a corner... The FBI contends that encryption by default is slowing down investigations, sucking up resources, and making the prevention and prosecution of criminal activity more difficult. Wow. Chief Policy Advisor for Science and Technology, Sasha O'Connell, is tasked with handling the problem, known at the Bureau as going dark. What is going dark? A whole series of technological changes are creating a situation where, for example, when we have a search warrant authorized by a judge, we simply cannot get the evidence, in this case, digital evidence, that we need that's authorized to gather to move the investigation forward. Do you feel like there are cases that are going unsolved because of this issue? So unfortunately, you know, I mean, we will never know exactly. It's hard to know what we don't know. And that's what keeps us up at night, frankly, right? We don't know what we don't know and what we're missing because of this issue. <laughs> What's your recommendation for going dark? Our goals or what we want in going dark is that when we have lawful authority to be able to execute on that, right, and to access that data, the form in which that happens, the decisions or mechanisms used to get from here to there, we're pretty agnostic on, frankly, right? And but they're the not our in the details. I mean, that, sure. that's where how you get that information is what this whole debate is about, in a way. We have, for example, uh, lawful authority and search warrants that we exercise today in partnerships with providers who maintain provider-controlled access to content. And we do that effectively every day today. So the argument that if, if that model was to be expanded, we'd be in a world of, you know, a world of herd and that would be untenable, doesn't hold a ton of water because we're doing that every day today. But do, you have the world's largest tech company saying no. Uh, they can't give you the kind of access you're asking for without putting everyone else at risk. I think taking an absolutist view on this isn't really constructive in terms of practical policy decisions and products, right? So, so that's where there's sort of two different, the absolutist kind of academic view of absolute data security, or then talking about the products we use every day, which strike that balance for convenience and other business reasons, right? A, potentially a little bit less data security, but for a benefit, we're arguing for public safety. The San Bernardino case, wasn't that the specific request of the U.S. government that Apple said was an overreach and that they were resisting was the idea that they would write an update to the operating system that would allow an end around to the security that's placed on the phone? So the situation again in San Bernardino is similar to the situations we face across the board, which is we have lawful authority to get access to content, being on a phone or a laptop. The mechanism used there is, is really in the hands of the provider. Right? Our goal, right, and, uh, and the judge has agreed with us, is that we need that content. It's interesting that the judge agreed in the sense of a warrant, mm -hmm. but the judge didn't agree in the sense of, is it the tech company's responsibility to invent a way for you to do that? Mm -hmm. That never came to a decision because the FBI withdrew its case. Mm -hmm. Why did the FBI withdraw its case there? In the case of that one phone, um, we ended up getting into the phone, as you know, um, and so there was no need to keep the litigation going forward. The FBI is trying to frame it as if, like, they are losing access to everything. You know, they have um, no visibility into what's happening anymore. And the truth is that in that situation, they had a lot of visibility, a lot of access, right? Um, they needed the access that they were requesting because they might be missing something, some small little thing, right? And obliquely, they're asking us to take steps towards a world where that's no longer true, right? But the thing about a world where the FBI never misses anything, is that's also a world where the FBI has access to everything.
the core of the argument is that like we need blanket visibility into everything that's going online because because terrorists like, think of the children it's part of the general saber rattling around going dark uh, which is is amusing because the corollary of that is revealed by leaks shows that we're living in the golden age of surveillance uh, because everyone generates so much data these days we carry around devices which like constantly beacon our location you know i'm i'm constantly sending messages about what i'm thinking and doing uh, and and so the, the the vast volumes of data that are generated and collected uh, don't suggest a going dark problem at all morgan mckeebwar is the head of security for first look media and a researcher at the citizen lab like many security experts, he's known to be able to hack the very things he works to protect. I wanted to know if a hacker or the FBI could access my messages even if they were encrypted on my iPhone. The type of encryption that is you know, used in iPhones that is respected by industry academia as robust is rarely the most obvious place to attack from a security perspective. So if you wanted to, could you hack my phone? Your iPhone? If, if, if I didn't want you to. Short answer is yes. I'd probably have to get really inventive. There's, I mean, there's sort of a variety of options for compromising a phone. It depends on the scenario. For instance, there's a variety of software that is reasonably cheap to purchase and freely available online. It's generally sold under the auspices of monitoring your kids. Online, I found FlexiSpy. Silently monitor all communications, locations, and user behavior of a smartphone. It really can access the messages, location, camera, and microphone of someone else's phone. It'll tell you the passcode of the phone. Having said that, installing this on your phone is largely predicated on us being physically proximate, and probably physically proximate frequently. In order to break into someone's iPhone remotely, there's, you actually need more or less you know, to find several bugs in Apple's security. So there's you know, a, a chain of things that you would have to exploit. So, you know, the current prices floating around for a full-chain iPhone exploit are upwards of a million US dollars, which is, that's some scratch. As it turned out, Morgan's colleagues at Citizen Lab had recently discovered sophisticated spyware able to infect an iPhone 6 remotely. Its target was in the UAE. Its source, an obscure company called NSO Group, based in Israel. It all comes back here to San Francisco. NSO was bought in 2014 in a deal that had to be approved by the Israeli Defense Ministry by a private equity firm called Francisco Partners. And they're actually located here at the Presidio, just in the shadow of the Golden Gate Bridge. Bill Marchek tracks the digital spyware industry and its use by governments around the world. Hey, Bill. Hey, it's Scott. Josh Russian with Fault Lines. How are you? Nice to meet you. I'm just trying to uh, test this guy's phone in uh, in the UAE to see if it's infected. What did you find here about Pegasus? So Pegasus is capable of uh, exfiltrating a large variety of information from the phone, um, including anything you type in apps or SMS. Uh, any phone calls you have, whether they're on the regular phone itself or in an app like WhatsApp or Viber or Skype, uh, can hook into those apps and basically get uh, your voice, uh, your picture, and anything that you that you type, including passwords. Even in encrypted communication programs like Signal? That's correct, that's correct. Uh, the benefit of the spyware is that it's able to intercept the data before the encryption is, is applied or after the decryption is applied. How did you find out about this most recent attack? Well, so I've been in touch with Ahmed Mansour, uh, a dissident in the United Arab Emirates for quite some time now. And at around, I guess, 1.30 a.m. on August 10th, I got this message from him saying, hey, Bill, I've, I got a weird SMS. The message seemed targeted, promising Mansour, a human rights activist, revelations about torture in UAE prisons if he opened a link. Instead, Bill typed it into a burner phone and clicked. For about 10 seconds, nothing happened. And then I saw that the, the web browser, Safari, just closed. It exited spontaneously. It's very weird. Um, and then the phone just kind of stayed 
you know, on the, the home screen, nothing was really happening on the phone. Uh, but meanwhile, on my laptop screen, the log of events was going crazy. There was lots of messages being sent and received. It looked like something was being downloaded and installed on the iPhone. But wait, no, you can't install an app on an iPhone unless it comes from the iPhone store. Exactly. Apple takes very, very strong precautions to make sure that's the case. But in this case, what, we, what had happened was there was an exploit, actually. It was called a zero-day remote jailbreak. Um, very, very rare. It's been kind of the stuff of legend. No one has ever seen one in the wild. Um, but it turned out that's exactly what we were looking at. A security firm called Lookout did more forensic tests. Then they contacted Apple to disclose the vulnerabilities that found. Mansoor is in the UAE. Here we go. I skyped Mansoor. He'd been targeted in the past and infected once with spyware made by a firm called Hacking Team. Bill and his colleagues suspect the UAE government is responsible. What, what were the opinions that got the government there so upset? Or, or what was so offensive? I was one of the initiators of uh, uh, a petition that called for uh, democratic reform in 2011, a few weeks before my arrest. And that uh, apparently uh, provoked them uh, a lot. For you on the ground, What's the reality and the risk of, of this kind of software and this kind of surveillance? Well, the, the risk is huge, really. I mean, uh, there are so many people that were arrested uh, in UAE and in other parts of the region, uh, and we suspe suspect that they were arrested after some sort of a uh, intrusion into their devices. Uh, the UAE's embassy in Washington did not reply to U.S. media requests for comment. NSO Group won't confirm its wares were used to target Mansoor, but says it only sells technology to authorized government agencies for the purpose of preventing and investigating crime. Are there agencies in the U.S. government that also would buy this type of technology? If you look at the intelligence side, um, pretty much agencies like the NSA, they already have strong technical expertise to build this stuff themselves. So they don't need to go to NSO and buy it. Um, but on the law enforcement side, you know, we have seen, for instance, uh, the FBI, the DEA, uh, and the Department of Defense were customers of, of Hacking Team. You know, the FBI is not going to develop this themselves. Wow. When, when you think about the recent debate with um, Apple and the FBI, right. from a security perspective, what do you take away from that? We clearly have enough trouble with security without someone writing an update to introduce a security vulnerability. I mean, you know, even if you don't intend to build in a security vulnerability, as in this case with Ahmed Mansour, someone will find it and exploit it. So if you do deliberately build something in, you've also got to expect that, that you know, someone's going to find it and exploit it. As Apple versus FBI wound down, U.S. Senators Dianne Feinstein and Richard Burr released draft legislation proposing a solution to the encryption debate. It would allow federal judges to force U.S. companies to hand over their clients' plain text data to law enforcement, effectively banning strong end-to-end -end encryption. But the bill hasn't been introduced, and the U.S. government's divided. Congressman Ted Lieu is one of only four computer science majors elected to Congress. Uh, one of the senators said that encryption is the Achilles heel of the internet. I have the exact opposite view. My view is that encryption is the armor of the internet. Uh, you can't have the internet operate without encryption. And U.S. national security depends on encryption. We want to strengthen encryption. We do not want to weaken it. Lou sees the vulnerabilities compelled decryption would create for foreign companies to exploit. Let's say Congress passes a law mandating backdoors. Well, you know, it wouldn't apply to a Samsung. So you're, you know, not even very smart terrorists and go, OK, well, I'll stop buying my Apple and I'll just go buy a phone from another country and start using that, right? But the crypto wars show no sign of coming to an end. What we want to do is collect information this year so that next year we can have an adult conversation in this country. This is really in the hands of the American people. We don't want to be sliding to a place, though, where people are surprised. They think uh, law enforcement has capabilities that, and that, frankly, just are no longer effective. This is fundamental. You, you can't have security without strong cryptography. Um, and so if the FBI is going to continue to push for this, we're going to have to continue to push back because we want a secure internet. 
So now we have to just wait for the next circumstance where they feel like they have the perfect uh, legal challenge and then do it all over again. Do you feel like Signal could be the, the target of that? Maybe. I mean, it could happen. It can't happen the same way because like, we just like, there's literally no way for us to access the information. But you know, I, I mean, we'll see.